Okay, are we, are we ready to go? Um, we've, so, thus far, we've dealt with the evolution of genetic science and technology. We've dealt with the ethical challenges which have arisen. And now our task is to turn to the, the possible solutions to the challenges which have been raised. And in that context, what we are going to do is turn to the solutions, legislative solutions, which were adopted in the United States. So my privilege now is to welcome our first contributor from the United States, Professor Michael Waterstone. Michael is Associate Dean for Research and Academic Centres and Fellow and Professor of Law at Loyola Law School. He clerked for the Honourable Richard Arnold on the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. He practiced law in Los Angeles. For, for a period of three years, he taught law in the University of Mississippi, Mississippi Law School. He joined Loyola's faculty in the fall of 2006. He's a nationally recognized expert in disability and civil rights law. He's one of the co-authors of a leading casebook on disability law, and he has recently published in the Harvard Law Review, the Notre Dame, or Notre Dame, as he would say, Law Review, Minnesota Law Review, Duke Law Journal, Vanderbilt Law Review, and other journals. He is a, an associate colleague, associated colleague with the Harvard Law School Project on Disability and an affiliated researcher with the Burton Blatt Institute as well as having consulted on projects with the National Council of Disability, the World Bank, and the Vietnam Assistance for the Handicapped. I'd like to welcome, on your behalf, Michael Waterstone. Thank you for that kind introduction, and really, thank you for uh, inviting me to be here. It's my privilege and honor to be amongst you today. I've never been to Ireland or to Galway, so this is a particular treat. I've enjoyed myself very much so far and look forward to hopefully coming back many times. In particular, I want to thank Ashling and Jared for putting this together. Putting a high quality conference like this together is extraordinarily hard. I really appreciate the interdisciplinary nature of this conference. I've certainly learned a lot already and I look forward to that continuing throughout the day. So the purpose of my talk today is to explain what the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, and the acronym is GINA, uh, is. And so briefly speaking, it's fairly simple. The law prohibits discrimination on the basis of genetic information in both the provision of health insurance and employment. I want to talk about the policies behind the law animating its passage and its journey through the United States Congress. Uh, I want to offer some early evaluations and indeed criticisms of the act. And, and this is all in hope that the work that we've done in the United States will be helpful um, here and in other places. You both can learn from maybe any successes that we've had, but also from our mistakes. At the beginning, I want to acknowledge and note that it, Paul Miller, I don't know if any of you know Paul Miller, he was a, uh, a, a Sadly, late friend and colleague of mine, Paul was an EEOC commissioner, uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. He was a commissioner there. He was an advisor to Presidents Clinton and Obama. He was a law professor. Paul was one of the early architects and advocates for GINA, and, and I really do consider it unfortunate that, it, that it's I and not he that's invited to um, address you here today about this, because Paul was a very special person and a very important figure in this area, so I hope that my talk today honors him and his work. Um, and finally, I want to acknowledge a colleague that I have here from the United States, Anya Prince, who's sitting in the front row. Anya and I, uh, Anya's a member of the Disability Rights Legal Center at Loyola Law School's campus. Uh, she's been very helpful to me as I've been putting this presentation together, and I do hope you have the opportunity to visit with her and introduce yourself to her. Uh, she's a very exciting researcher and lawyer uh, in this area. So let me give you a little bit about the American landscape before GINA, before the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So by way of background, as we learned this morning, in 1990, scientists began the Human Genome Project, which was an effort to sequence the human genome. And the results were released in 2003, although I learned today that they're not completely done. Um, I had probably, like a lot of people, assumed that their work was completed. Um, 
And now over thousands of genetic tests are available. The hope in the Human Genome Project was that this would lead to a better understanding of genetically linked health conditions, but obviously it fed fears that it could create new opportunities for different types of discrimination. Now, there were some limited protections within health insurance law and employment law pre-GINA in the United States. We weren't completely starting from a blank playing field. Unfortunately, to even give you the bird's eye version of this really requires a basic understanding of the rather tortured way that we de uh, deliver health care in the United States. So I'll try to briefly comment on this. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and the acronym there that you'll hear is HIPAA, prohibits, not HIPPO, HIPAA, prohibits group health insurers, so groups that provide health insurance, from using genetic discrimination, uh, genetic information, in determining eligibility for insurance or in setting premiums. So that sounds good that HIPAA does that and has done it for some time, but uh, it doesn't limit insurance companies from getting genetic information. And they can turn down whole groups on the basis of the genetic information. So they can take a pass on contracting with a particular employer to provide health insurance for that employer's company because if they perceive that there is some genetic risk within that pool. That law, HIPAA, does not apply to individual insurance policies. And perhaps most saliently, there's no prohibition on employers under HIPAA discriminating on the basis of genetic information. And in the United States, employers are providers of health insurance to huge numbers of Americans. And under HIPAA, they are open to discriminating on the basis of genetic information in how they hire employees. Many individual states do have laws, so not at the federal level, but at the individual state level, have laws protecting against genetic discrimination, both in health insurance and in employment. But it's limited because federal law preempts, which means it establishes the only permissible source of regulation for employer-provided plans, health plans that employers provide for their employees, which is how over half of Americans get their health insurance. So even the strongest state regulations by law, by virtue of our federalism system, can't impact about half of people that are getting health insurance in that state. There is also the Americans with Disabilities Act, which many of you uh, may be familiar with. It's our omnibus anti disability anti-discrimination statute. The first part of that act, what we commonly refer to as Title I, prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in employment. Now, it's unclear if individuals with a genetic predisposition to disease could be covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. To the extent they could be covered, it's most likely that they're covered under the provision of the definition of disability that says someone could be considered a disability if the employer or putative employer regards them as having a disability. So you could make the case that if an employer views an individual because of their genetic makeup as potentially having a disability that they are being, for all intents and purposes, regarded as having a disability. Seems logical, makes sense. Um, without digressing too far into the way that courts have interpreted the definition of disability, most courts that have looked at this, and particularly the Supreme Court, although they haven't looked at the genetic information issue specifically, have taken such a narrow, really narrow view of the definition of disability that it makes it unlikely that individuals uh, who have a genetic predisposition to disease would in fact be covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. But there are divergent views here. The agency, the administrative federal agency that's responsible for enforcing the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, what we'll refer to as the EEOC, they take the position that it is covered, but courts have really interpreted it in a very narrow, different way. Most recently, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act was amended in the Americans with Disabilities Amendments Act, broadening the definition of disability. And this actually makes it more likely that individuals with a genetic predisposition 
to a disease could be covered, but there are no cases on this yet. It's still untested in the courts. Another federal anti-discrimination law in the United States that could be relevant here is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Title VII prohibits discrimination in employment on the basis of race, amongst other things, national origin. Theoretically, discrimination on the basis of genetic information that's linked to certain races or ethnicities could be covered. But there's really only one case that does this. It was referred to this morning. The name of the case is Norman Bloodsaw versus Lawrence Berkeley Lab, where a court held that blood tests for sickle cell anemia did violate Title VII. But that in and of itself would be limited to genetic information that's linked to a particular ethnicity and very little case law on this. So into this landscape came GINA. And GINA came from a need to have a comprehensive statute prohibiting discrimination, particularly in the areas of health care and employment. GINA, as enacted, has two main parts. And I'd like to talk to you about both. The first part is Title I, dealing with health insurance. The second part is Title II, dealing with employment. So let me talk to you about each. The definition that applies across the board of a person's genetic information is such individuals' genetic tests, the genetic tests of any family members of such individual, and the manifestation of a disease or disorder in such individual. So Title I covering health insurance bars health insurers from using genetic information to determine coverage, eligibility, or premiums. It bars insurers from requesting or requiring genetic testing or genetic information or from obtaining genetic information for underwriting purposes. Insurers cannot treat genetic information as a pre-existing condition. Under our complicated health insurance system, individuals with pre-existing conditions have had trouble getting health insurance coverage. Some of this should be changed in the wake of the new health care reform, the Affordable Care Act, Although, as some of you may have heard, our Supreme Court uh, has agreed to review the constitutionality of that act, perhaps coincidentally, perhaps not, right in the lead up to the next presidential cycle. So a lot is up in the air as to where that will go. The health insurance portion of GINA includes a research exception that allows group health plans to request, but not require, uh, a person to undergo genetic testing for research purposes. And the plan must ensure that this is voluntary, that it has no effect on the insured status, that it's not used for underwriting, and that a government agency knows this research is going on. So that's the health insurance provisions. The next part deals with employment, Title II. Title II prohibits employers from hiring, firing, classifying or otherwise disadvantaging an employee on the basis of genetic information. It prohibits employers from requesting, requiring, or purchase genetic information. Now, most, like most American anti-discrimination law, it only applies to employers who have more than 15 employees. So there are some employers that are going to be too small for GINA to impact their operations. Title II makes clear that once, a genetic once genetic information manifests into an impairing condition, then GINA no longer applies. So it does not provide protection for genetically based illnesses. At that point, to the extent an individual is protected at all, it would be under the Americans with Disabilities Act. There is a water cooler exception under Title II of GINA. This was to, to deal with the case if the employer obtains genetic information through casual conversation. So for example, if an employee mentions that his or her mother passed away from breast cancer, or if an employer reads something in an obituary 
indicating that someone passed away from a genetic condition. Uh, there, is, there are also exceptions for employer-provided wellness programs. Uh, here, the individual must give voluntary authorization. The employer cannot get information unless it is in unidentifiable form. And that there are, th there's an exception for monitoring the effects of tox toxic substances on employees. There, there needs to be consent. And again, the employer can only get aggregate data. As I'll talk about, there is relatively little, if any, case law thus far on GINA. So the specific contours of those exceptions haven't really been determined yet in the courts. So those are the basics. I want to take a step back now and think about the overall approach that our Congress and our legislature has taken here. This is an anti-discrimination, civil rights type approach to the issue of how to protect genetic information. It plays into pre-existing anti-discrimination frameworks that we have in the United States, laws like Title VII, the Americans with Disabilities Act. It makes consideration of genetic information impermissible. As we've already thought about and learned about this morning, this was not the only way to go about this. It's not inevitable that if one wants to adopt, uh, one wants to try to legislate to protect this information, it needs to be under the anti-discrimination model. You could have, they could have gone through privacy law, creating a right of privacy, allowing individuals to decide when to disclose their genetic information. Or they could have gone through property law, right, conferring an economic right in one's genetic information. And indeed, five states have such a law. All of these options were considered uh, and ultimately rejected out of fears that, that would, th those forms of legislation would be ineffective, that there were grounds for exploitation. And I think in general this reflects an American comfort with the anti-discrimination approach to trying to solve and deal with social problems. Let's talk a little bit about the policies behind GINA, some of which we've talked about already this morning. This will give us some insight into GINA's long journey through Congress, which we've heard about, and I'll spend a little more time on after we talk about the policy. So there were concerns that genetic discrimination or perceived genetic discrimination was hampering research. People were afraid to get genetic tests or participate in genetic research because they feared that insurance companies or employers would use information against them. And if we don't have great information on how much discrimination was already occurring, and we heard about that this morning, we've got pretty good data on what people thought was happening or what their fears were. 93% of Americans believed prior to GINA that employers and health insurers should not be able to use genetic information in making decisions. Almost that same number believed that the negative results of genetic tests could harm them in either the employment context or the insurance context. Doctors believed that patients were not getting medical tests because their fear of discrimination. One third of women offered a genetic test related to breast cancer declined the test, specifically citing potential discrimination as the reason for declining it. And scientists reported that fear of genetic testing was negatively impacting genetic research. And what's particularly salient about fears of discrimination here is this type of fear is intergenerational, right? There's the fear that if I get a test and genetic information is revealed in that test, my children could be discriminated against on the basis of something that I've chose to do. There was also, in terms of a policy animating GINA, a belief that discrimination on the basis of genetic information is simply wrong, is simply offensive to moral principles which we hold dear. It aligns with American conceptions that discrimination on the basis of an immutable trait, which we can think of as something that you were born with, that's outside of your control, that it's extremely difficult, if even possible, to alter. Discrimination on the basis of immutability is wrong. And this traditionally within American constitutional and statutory law is an area where the law provides increased protection. Now, GINA, I think, is fascinating because 
it's unusual, it's unusual and really revolutionary is an anti-discrimination law. At least with an American anti-discrimination law, typically it looks backward. Usually we're attempting to stop an identified pattern or practice from continuing. If we look at the canon of anti-discrimination law, and we have a rich history of this, uh, you see whether it's Title VII, dealing with race and gender, the Americans with Disabilities Act, dealing with disability, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, dealing with discrimination against the elderly. Um, you see Congress responding to documented and pervasive patterns of discrimination. But in contrast with GINA, there was not a large documented history of genetic discrimination in either health insurance and or employment occurring at the time GINA was enacted, despite widespread fears of such discrimination. Certainly reviewing the case law does not show a whole lot. There's really a small universe of cases. One is the case I alluded to earlier, where an employer screened unknowingly for sickle cell anemia. The employee in that case sued under race discrimination statute and the case ultimately settled. Another example which we heard about this morning uh, was an employer testing employees without their knowledge for a genetic predisposition to carpal tunnel syndrome. The EEOC, so the Federal Enforcement Agency, sued the employer under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Ultimately, the case settled on terms that were favorable to the plaintiff. And a third case of an employee at an insurance company who lost their job after being diagnosed with genetic condition that manifests as a progressive lung disorder sued under the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's basically it, three cases. If you look at comparatively at other statutes, there's much more uh, of a documented history of discrimination before Congress steps in to act. One survey which gathered anecdotal information presented to Congress 500 cases nationwide of alleged employment discrimination on the basis of genetic information. And when you look closely at many of those examples, they don't really all fit with the idea of genetic discrimination on the basis of genetic information. Many of them appear to be disability-based discrimination. Um, so again, there's not necessarily a whole lot here. Now, as we also heard about this morning, this certainly can tie into a larger sad chapter, particularly in American history, of eugenics and forced sterilization, uh, which has been sanctioned, was sanctioned by our Supreme Court in the case of Buck v. Bell, which upheld the sterilization of feeble-minded, noting that it's preferable, quote, to prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their own kind, and noting, quote, three generations of imbeciles are enough. Between 1921 and 1964, states sterilized over 60,000 people in the United States without their consent. So certainly this history fed into the perceived need for an act uh, in this area as well. So when we think about GINA as a case of preemptive legislative action, there are really two sides to the story. One is that, well, given that there hasn't been a lot of discrimination, maybe this statute is not needed. There's sp the, the sparse case law on the books shows that it's not occurring all that much. And when it does, the laws that are already on the books work reasonably well. And this was called a remedy in search of a problem by opponents when it went through Congress. And it also noted that even though there are state laws, no one's really suing under these state laws, indicating that it may not be as big of a problem as one might think. The other side argued passionately that just because there are no cases does not mean that it's not happening or that the, the threat of discrimination on the basis of genetic information isn't deterring people from getting tests in the first place. Also, and I think this is quite important, it's a rare opportunity to get, to use law to get ahead of the curve and to use law to create a culture that this type of discrimination is not acceptable in health insurance or employment. So let me now tell you a little bit about Gina's journey through Congress, because all of these themes played out in Gina's 13-year slog through Congress. 13 years. That's a long time. If, if Gina was Jewish, Gina could have had its bar mitzvah by the time it actually came into law. So Gina was first introduced in 1994. It was reintroduced in some form each year until its passage in 2008. Now, the American political system, like all political systems, has its oddities. 
And you know, here, what's interesting was Gina had relatively high support on both sides of the political aisle, but it kept getting tripped up along the way. It ran into two problem areas, which mobilized a small but dedicated cadre of support against it. And both, I think, of these are unique to our political culture, although perhaps not. One was it ran right into the larger healthcare debate in terms of how we deliver healthcare in our country. It was first introduced in 1994 as part of the national debate on health care reform. And that national debate on health care reform fell apart, died, and ultimately became politically toxic and turned rather nasty. So the issue of genetic information really had to be disentangled from that broader debate to move forward. And insurance companies, at least initially, opposed the idea, purportedly on the grounds that they would be barred from recommending genetic tests that would enable people to get life-saving treatments. Um, I think, though, perhaps the more substantial opposition was the second. And this was lawsuit fatigue and tort reform, the business community growing weary of additional opportunities for individuals to sue and, in some cases, extract damage judgments from companies and businesses. So the business community feared that, a proposed, that this proposed law would increase litigation. And groups like the Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers really dug their heels in. And in a unique quirk of Senate procedure, one senator, Senator Tom Coburn from Oklahoma, who had earned the nickname Dr. No for holding up lots of bills, um, was particularly concerned that employers could and would get caught up in lawsuits between individuals and their insurance companies. And you, you see language in the legislative debates about not wanting to create a bonanza for trial lawyers. So ultimately, this was resolved by creating a firewall between the two portions of the act, uh, basically stopping plaintiffs from looping employers into a lawsuit if they're really trying to sue their insurance companies. You can sue an insurance company, you can sue an employer, but it's hard to sue both together. To show its broad consensus, Gina ultimately passed 95 to nothing in the Senate and 414 to 1 in the House of Representatives, showing broad acceptance. And it, it really shows what has been consistent within disability law, which is there are broad coalitions on the left and right to get legislative action passed. So in conclusion, and thinking about challenges ahead and implementation, uh, just a couple thoughts. And I hope I've conveyed to you the basics of what I consider to be a very exciting law. But I do want to begin a discussion of the challenges moving forward in this area, which will, which will be picked up by my colleague, Mira. So like anything else, one challenge in this area is getting individuals in the broader culture to have a knowledge, not about genetic information generally, which we heard about before, but about a knowledge of what the law actually requires. And there are real challenges here in the law generally, but certainly in this area. Individuals, a recent survey showed that only 16% of people who were surveyed were aware that there were laws protecting genetic privacy. Like any area, it takes time for a law to penetrate into popular consciousness. People are busy, right, particularly in low-income communities, and understanding genetic information and the legal responsibilities under that may not be at the top of anyone's list, particularly given a recession where, where many families are just trying to make ends meet. And, and there are also cultural barriers to discussing family illnesses in many communities. The State Department of Insurances, who are the front line of defense for enforcing the health provisions of GINA. Um, what record there is demonstrates that they may not be entirely aware of what they're required to do under the statute. And that likely reveals a real lack of systemic training for the people that are doing intakes in those agencies. Um, health insurers, so Anya, who does work in this field, uh, reports that health insurance workers are still asking about genetic information during their initial application calls. Um, again, it's unclear if this is just a lack of training or is a deliberate attempt to circumvent what the law requires. Um, some potential problem areas that we're seeing, again, primarily from anecdotal reports in the field. 
health insurers are required to put a disclaimer on any request for medical information stating that genetic information should not be included. It's not clear that that's really happening yet. In some cases, doctors may be inadvertently forwarding information, genetic information, to insurance companies, and it's not clear what happens with this information once they have it. At that point, it's fairly easy for them to use it without necessarily being detected. So this will be very, very interesting moving forward. One thing I, I know, particularly in the disability area, in the United States, we're quite good at putting things into statutes, into getting laws passed. And, and I'm proud of what our, our canon of anti-discrimination law relating to disability says. I think we have really some terrific laws on the books, but it's much harder to get them actually enforced. And, and some of the problems in enforcement that apply to other statutes that I and others have looked at certainly apply here, in terms of the health insurance provisions, there is no private right of action. So if I feel that my health insurance company has used genetic information to discriminate against me, I cannot go file a lawsuit against the insurance company and try to remedy that injustice. Rather, the enforcement powers rest with several federal agencies, which are already burdened with enforcing other statutes, and the penalties themselves are rather weak. On the employment side, there is a private right of action there, meaning if my employer discriminates against me on the basis of my genetic information, I can go sue. But a big chunk of that enforcement will have to run through the EEOC, which received 201 GINA complaints in 2010. That agency is always outmanned and suffering from a lack of resources, and there's no indication that they view genetic information discrimination as a priority over other areas. So, I am concerned about under-enforcement here. But, I mean, what makes GINA an interesting case is that maybe we won't have under-enforcement because the statute was passed at such an early point. It's not as if there is necessarily a ton of discrimination going on already. So, optimistically, this could be a case of the law actually deterring conduct on the front end. More pessimistically, employers and health insurers could find ways to avoid the law and use the information anyway. So I guess just to finally conclude, you know, and hope, one thing I hope we talk about and consider today, in the universe of regulation of genetics, already in the first two panels, we heard of the rich array of things that arise in this field. Uh, forensic crime work, all of these different uh, areas of potential regulation. Although Gina's groundbreaking, it is a relatively modest statute, right? It targets health insurance and employment. I think, given what we learned this morning about where we are in the science, which made clear that if we're not at the beginning, we're certainly at a point where there's a lot more to do. Given that, that modesty may make sense, and I think may be the right policy choice, because the more you try to regulate, the more you have to may have to undo as the science evolves. I think with Gina, we kind of identified the important values in a way that would protect individuals' privacy but still allow the research to go forward. Time will tell how successful this attempt was. Um, but in any event, I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and look forward to uh, answering any questions and engaging in a discussion on these issues. Thank you. On your behalf, I'd like to thank Michael for his wonderfully succinct and clear summary of the United States uh, legislative response uh, as embodied in GINA. Uh, obviously, there will be questions later on uh, on that issue.